excited to be here. Um, as uh, Susan was talking about some movements uh, that are going on within this institution, um, I too am moving out of Oklahoma um, at the end of this year to go to St. Louis. I'm really excited, already talking to Jen about having the opportunity to bring some of our great Oklahoma artists to St. Louis, where I'll be the deputy director of the Craft Alliance. Um, and this is the first time I'm publicly talking about it, and I think it's really um, great to come full circle because the very first show I curated in Oklahoma was, in fact, here at 108 Contemporary. Um, when Susan was talking about my work as an independent curator, uh, I was uh, the first show, the very first time I came to Oklahoma, I, I was brought here to curate a show in this very space. So it's, um, it's particularly special to me that I was able to um, be a juror for this show um, and think back on all that I've learned about Oklahoma and all the great artists I've gotten to know over the course of my time here. Um, so uh, with that said, um, I'm really hoping tonight that, um, that I can convince all of our artists to talk a little bit more about our piece. So I hope I'm not gonna be talking too much, um, but we'll be, I'm happy to answer questions about the process. I can just say, very exciting to have the opportunity to not only see artists that I already knew, but get to know some new artists over the course of this process. Um, really great to see all the amazing things that artists have been doing over, um, the course of a time when we were all felt so isolated often that we did get out. I hear this is the first uh, first Friday, uh, which blew me away when I came here uh, for the show that I curated so many years ago. And I'm so glad to see that it's going to come back uh, stronger than ever um, here in Tulsa. And um, so I, I'm just uh, delighted to be here. I'm delighted to uh, hear more from these artists. and. Um, really uh, to see the art that was thriving after the pandemic, but often kept us going during the pandemic too. A lot of these arts, uh, these works are so meaningful to me because I was, um, you know, it was a tough time for all of us. We were all so isolated and that's really um, one of the things that art does and I'd say craft in particular is it really nourishes the soul. Um, so with that said, um, I'm gonna bring us to the first artist <laughs> to, right. to talk and um, please, yes, tell us about your piece. All right, thank you, Jennifer. So, Blue Jar uh, may seem like a misnomer in terms of identifying what kind of object this is, but uh, in my practice, I seem to be always pulled to a at least category of vessel. I think there's something uh, very, let's say, romantic about a pot, in a way. Uh, it's something that you use daily and things along those lines. Uh, and then in my art practice, I try and kind of, cur, let's say, kerfuffle that sort of intended purpose or function. Uh, but at the same time, by uh, sort of violating that contract with pottery, I think something really beautiful and amazing comes out of that process. And so this piece is inspired mainly by geological, uh, geological mineral specimens. So it's very like, flashy and uh, sort of sometimes like, Almost too, they're almost like too gaudy to believe that they come, you know, directly out of the earth, that they're right beneath our feet. But that's also a very important aspect about my practice in that uh, oftentimes some of the most beautiful moments go unnoticed uh, simply because we're too distracted by, you know, screens or our busy day or what have you. But I think really we just have to slow down uh, and come to appreciate the things that we find the day to day. And so for, to emphasize that, or to focus that, I like to use pottery as a mode, and then using these very uh, abstracted and often over-the-top kind of surfaces and textures, uh, draw attention to, uh, to, these, uh, to these pots. Any questions? Thank you. Um, I had, um, I'm going to use this an opportunity, I, I didn't want to put you into any categories yet because I know your, your work is very abstract, um, but that was a great segue. Thank you so much for setting me up for my category discussion. Um, I uh, am a curator and so I find myself often trying to organize things into larger themes, so I did that somewhat loosely for this show. Um, and the first theme that we're going to walk through is uh, called Earth. I related all of these themes to our experience during the pandemic. And um, I saw that uh, 
in a lot of cases for me, a lot of time, I spent a lot of time walking the dog out in the parks, really enjoying nature, and nature really served as a, uh, a source of comfort and um, a, a real connection in a time when uh, we weren't allowed to be out in workplaces. So um, the, the first uh, sort of pandemic related theme uh, was the, the role of the earth and how important it is uh, for all of us um, and has been over the course of the pandemic. So um, if you're an artist and I, uh, and I jump over your work, please raise your hand and let me know that, uh, that I'm skipping your work if you want to talk about it. Um, but I'm just going to kind of go through um, some of the beautiful works <coughs> that we we get to an artist who is here who can talk about their work. So this was Audrey Peck's jewelry, always really gorgeous, always doing really interesting um, creative things and uh, really related to this idea of topography and the earth. Um, so I'm just going to talk about it very quickly. I know we've got a lot of artists and I'd rather hear from them. These works, I don't think are very tame, she's not here tonight, um, but spectacular sort of um, the embroideries of, uh, of the really forests, nature, the woods. Um, I love the way that she's taken some very sort of literal representations and then turned them into like creating uh, this pink earth or turning them into real um, abstractions. Uh, so they become a source of inspiration, but then she, with her uh, gorgeous embroidery techniques, take them off into a different direction. Um, this is titled Earth Matters, and this is just a conceptualization of climate change and what our world could possibly look like in the turmoil that, that, that our climate uh, change is creating. The carnelian represents the, the massive wildfires that have kind of popped up recently. And this tal it's kind of a talisman necklace, and this is a nod to the past. This piece right here is called tectite, and it is uh, created when the, uh, large meteors hit the earth, and it's the glass that's created from that impact. So this piece is 35 million years old, and it's a nod to the last time we had major climate change, and that was when we lost the dinosaurs, and that was 35 million years ago. So um, I did burnish a few pieces. This is all fused silk, silver. But I burnished a few pieces because we do have the opportunity to have an alternate ending to the story. Uh, we just need to make some changes as humanity needs to make some changes with Mother Earth. And so not all is lost. Yeah, this one is called the thinning zone of habitability. And on this side is carbon dioxide data that I embedded in this leather piece. And on that side is open coronavirus data. And these point to the Earth. And the, the, the sunset here shows kind of the peril that we're in with, with climate change. I have uh, tooled leather for 18 years. And one of the things I did with, in the pandemic is try to think of ways that I can directly incorporate scientific data into these craft pieces to enhance kind of the message that's, that's coming across. Uh, I grew up in one of the Rust Belt cities where redlining, urban renewal, interstate highway construction was used to oppress basically black people. And I had a lot of time to think during the pandemic, too much time. And this piece comes out as, as a memory of those things that happened where I grew up. And it's, it's a message of how it impacted. And in fact, that city is still very impoverished. And this is a memory of that. And in fact, it was kind of cathartic to do this because I'm not as confident by these memories. Um, so uh, artists who are working on those things will pop back in. But right now, I wanted to turn. Are you ready to talk about your work, yes. which is right around there? Um, so I work really about objectively. Um, I'll kind of start out with one piece and think about what that piece means, and then start adding like other characters or like resources or plants or like creatures into it. And I just have. Um, they, so they don't have like set stories, but there's like feelings or people I know or ideas that kind of fed into them. So they have narratives, but they're not necessarily set narratives, which is why um, I didn't say a lot about kind of what they meant to me, because I like to leave that kind of open. Um, this is the only piece I made in 2021. Um, 
it was just really hard. Actually, I think it went not 2020, 2020. Um, so it was just with the pandemic, it was really hard to make. Um, I think that's kind of reflected in the title. So does this start, I'm, I'm curious if this starts with you drawing it, or do you do a little bit of freehand design? How do you, how does a piece yeah. like this come about? So with these, I started doing something different. Um, in the past, I would find um, fabrics or different patterns that I found interesting and work with those, but I started designing them digitally in Illustrator and then having them printed and then embroidered on top of them. So I'm kind of drawing the backgrounds in mass, like 10 or 15 at a time and printing them. And um, if you're allowed to tell me that my categories are all off. So I put you in the earth and nature category. Is there a reason why plants and, and nature is uh, an opportunity, sort of a base for you to create these very fantastical worlds that you yeah. created? I think because I have, um, for lack of a better word, a lot of anxiety about climate change, that like I'm constantly thinking about the planet and our impact on it. Um, and I have kids, and so like, what kind of earth am I making for them? And so it seems like our choices as people and kind of plants, like there's a lot of interconnectivity. Um, and also, you know, like plants are food, and who has access to plants and resources, or who has access to like green spaces in nature. And so I'm thinking a lot about those kinds of things. Um, these are from two different bodies of work, but they all are about the same thing. This is about my concern for the forest fires that are going on and how much we're losing in nature for the trees. Uh, the piece itself is beads that are set in wax like the Weech All Method. So that's one way I work. This is knotted and this is a felt piece and this one is really addressing global warming and how we're losing the water or the ice and it's turning into water, but there's in the middle, if you look, there's a small egg shape that represents hope because I think we can rescue this or turn it around somewhat. And then this one is open and airy, and these are bits of monarch butterfly wings. So we know what the situation is with the monarchs. Uh, and I kept it open so that it would look more like light and airiness. Uh, otherwise, that's pretty much the way I work. Almost everything I have has to do with um, concern with global warming and climate change. Um, so I'm really interested uh, in the way that these three works look like almost like three different artists. You've chosen very different material. This one's incredibly <coughs> detail oriented. This one is much more expansive in its approach. Do you want to talk a little bit about, is it just the work itself and the idea you want to convey? Is it the materials? What inspires you to, to, to work and then to really, to really choose a technique and a, an aesthetic almost that fits that material? Well, frankly, some of it is just what I'm in the mood to work with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's also, I mean, that's the honest answer, but it's also something like this is a heavier topic with the earth and the melting and that kind of thing. So I was choosing to do a bowl shape. And this, this looks, I think Catherine said that this looks heavy. But it's not heavy, and it's how it's held up, and the our earth is that way. So I deliberately chose that. Um, and this is a little bit of a different uh, kind of formation for me. Usually they are um, kind of different uh, natural objects, and they're in kind of rings, starting from the center, working their way out, and different sticks, rocks, all kinds of things. But I love this idea of being able to create a circular form using just one element, but then changing the color and still keeping it, um, engaging the viewer to kind of, I like the idea of Nadal's uh, drawing you in and asking you to sit, look, and listen. And this, I think, does the same thing in a different way. And so it's something new I'm kind of exploring um, and I love the contrast between the energy of the color with the quietness of the, of the light. So those two things together are really important. And I titled the piece Halo, so it does have an element, uh, in my opinion, of this kind of being um, rising up out of the ashes, that concept of being kind of reborn or rebuilt or uh, recreated, and that is part of this form, which is kind of that color contrast. So. 
So this idea of this transition from nature to self. So this category um, looks at the self. I know a lot of us um, spent a lot of time out in nature. Um, some of us were forced in a house with a lot of people. But essentially, we spent a lot of time in our heads, right, over the course of this pandemic. So I'm just going to say the one thing I want to say about this, which is um, this idea of landscape is another great transitional piece, because I feel like the landscape I saw the most was the landscape of my bed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, that's your setup. Yeah. Um, that's great. Um, Yes, I'm a really big fan of rest. <laughs> yes. And beds specifically, like I spend a lot of time in my bed, and that's where I do a lot of my like daydreaming and sketching with projects. And um, it's honestly just my favorite place to be. <laughs> so I um, have historic. I've historically just been uh, primarily a quilter, and then kind of moved into more installation-based work and murals, and um, I'm really interested in the idea of like um, being totally like enveloped or encased in like quilts specifically, and then like patterns and um, textures. And um, prior to like, primarily I was working in very functional quilts that I had a very staunch opinion on being used. <laughs> Like, I really wanted people to use them and wrap themselves in it, an idea of having touched every, like, me making it, touching every part, and then, like, that being such an intimate part of their life as well. Um, and then I, about three years ago, kind of shifted my thought process completely and was thinking more about quilts that are intentionally not functional um, and looking more at the um, shape of a bed and what a quilt would look like after it's been used, just kind of wrapped with the front across the bed. And all of these, uh, this series I call Sleep Study, and they're all based off of photos I've taken of my bed after waking up from a nap or um, a deep sleep, so. Really, more and more with my work, I've enjoyed a, uh, putting a, a narrative element into the sculptures that I do. And this one, I um, I did have some some frightening news over the summer about my vision, and I wanted to um, I wanted to make something that had uh, some frightening vision troubles right now with my car here. <laughs> um, I wanted to make something that expressed how helpless I felt and that I was not in control, and um, so with this, I I, I decided to put the hands coming from behind that represented an outside force. And, and then the news got better, so it's fine. But, um, <laughs> and so with all the pieces that I make, I, I really think it's important and I enjoy kind of having them keep me company and having them around for a while and, and seeing how what I think about that piece evolves and what that piece is saying to me. And, Kind of a relationship that I have with it, and I have several pieces around that through the, the last couple of years have kind of been friends to me, and I enjoy seeing them. Um, this one, as the time went by, I started to relate it more to what is currently seeming to be an issue as far as. The, what we are we are limited in the the information that we are presented and we are limited in the uh, vision that we are sometimes even allowed to have of our world and our circumstances and what is happening and the, that someone or some force outside of ourselves, is controlling that and we are not as in control of what our vision is as we need to be and would like to be. So that's the way this piece evolved and um, the finish is one that I have enjoyed working with, uh, the clay. I usually use a red clay in my sculptures that has to do with uh, being from Oklahoma 
and, and, and enjoying the, the red clay association with, with my home and the mark making and the colors of the bird. But this really struck me as this idea of craft and craft as a source of comfort or craft as a way to, um, to really express inner feelings. Um, these had to do with pills that Sean has to take. Um, and, and to some degree, and I, I, I hope that the makers in here will agree, there's, there's a process of healing as you go through um, the, the ability to make something and the time that that takes and the care that that takes. Um, so I just thought this was a beautiful way to express some really difficult experiences that, um, that she did was um, particularly, so I just talked about the, the use of, of craft as a way to sort of get through difficult experiences. Do you want to talk about that a little bit in relation to this piece? Yeah, so like before you can talk about the piece directly, my mother passed away at the beginning of last year, and she, I was unable to see her for over a year because of the pandemic. And she had an autoimmune disease, so like no deep And then like the whole grieving process was so compressed and like not what I think most of us are typically used to. I found myself afterwards having like, you know, what do I do? Like, there's no way to deal with this. And so I just started making work kind of in relationship to my mom and like looking at you know, like mythology. And in the case of my mom, she was a, like sewing was her hobby. So I looked at her into Greek mythology Morai, which were the three fates, which the last of which it was all kind of cloth themed. You, know, you had the spinner who spun cloth like, the portioner who measured it, and then the uh, Atropos was the one who cut the cloth alive. So this one's represented by a pair of scissors cutting a hole in the thread. And it's a historical piece of jewelry called a vinaigrette, which was kind of like old perfume. filled it with a scent of uh, like anise and licorice, which is what I said I was associated with my mom. It was really powerful memories. And I also uh, was looking at other types like mourning jewelry, um, such as uh, eye miniatures, which were carried around to like, remind you of a loved one. So they were always with you. Yeah, because I think like as a crafter, I hope everybody else like kind of feels the same way. Like they're sort of like, like I can always do something with my hands. Like I've, I've got something I can control. And a lot of my jewelry, there's like a lot of repetitive stuff, like making links or a lot, a lot of texture. And it's kind of like a meditation where I can just sit down and do something over and over again you know, and have like kind of like a cathartic you know, therapy. <laughs> sure, sure. Would you, is your other jewelry different from this in terms of, or disconnected to this, other things you've done in terms of the, the connection with mythology and narrative? This or even is quite a bit different. Yeah. Okay. So this is definitely like me getting away from um, what I used to do, a lot of like really modernist, really simple jewelry, not a lot of texture. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is a very yeah. different jewelry. It's very different. Well, they're beautiful. It's Thank really you. Beautiful. Your work is less narrative and much more abstract than a lot of pieces. Different roles um, that we 
play every day in life. Um, and so that's just my visual representation of, of that. <laughs> and then the last one is called Ray of Hope. Self-explanatory. <laughs> is there a the um, is there a color the color choice that you're using? Is this idea of breaking up a, an optical ray into lots of different light waves? Like where, or is it just that you felt really hopeful after making this piece? Um, I think it's a reminder to me to be hopeful because sometimes I I struggle with that. Um, the pandemic's been really hard on all of us, and so. I think it's just a good reminder when I look at that to remain hopeful. A little bit, this is the voices section. So um, as I said, we had several artists that kind of made reference to a lot of the political ideas that um, came up, a lot of the um, a lot of the things that were brought to our attention uh, that perhaps we hadn't been talking about before. Um, and this is, I know, an ongoing project of ease uh, to, um, to reach out to the community, but I would love to hear this piece, which is um, a little bit a new direction for you and your ceramics as well, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my name is Alexander Demello. Um, I am actually losing my vision very slowly over time. Um, I also have severe hearing loss and wear hearing aid. And about six years ago, I stopped driving, um, and I was doing ceramic. And the process of making was really a way of coping with what was happening to my body. Um, and at that time, I chose to kind of write all the feelings that I had about my body breaking down in this way that I couldn't control um, directly on the cuffs and rail. So whether it was optimistic thoughts or really uh, the darkest thought that I had about it, all of it was going on these cuffs. Um, and so that was kind of the theory that I worked on for that time. And it's kind of evolved now. Um, I'm at a place where the work that I make is, especially this series, they come from um, a collection of work called uh, Mantra, and it's really intended to be an offering to all of you. It's a gentle reminder to kind of slow down and take in the world and breathe. Um, these are kind of things that I tell myself that probably had come from my parents. Um, so like these two cups here, it says in the Braille, like, you belong here. Um, these, they look for beauty in the world. And then this one just said breathe over and over. And it's a meditative process for me to apply the braille. Um, and I like to add the gold because I think it, um, it comes across as something beautiful. And I think that even then perfect things are beautiful and that um, there is there's a place for people like me in the world. Um, so yeah, so I, I continue to transition these ide ideas to um, include other voices, so I'm in the process of interviewing people um, who may not feel like they belong in the world and putting their work um, on functional pieces that can be shared with others. Um, do you, now these are all vessels that can be used, mm -hmm. um, I, I happen to own this, so maybe there's a home that is in fact a cup that, that can be used for things like tea. Is that really important to you? Do you see these now as sculptural or um, is the idea that somebody would hold it, put it to their lips, and kind of interact with it really important to you as well? Yeah, yeah. A couple of other artists have talked about um, the intimacy of an object being used, and that's something that's really important to me as well. I just like the idea of someone that I don't even know um, using something and maybe finding healing in an object that was healing for me to make. Um, so I think that. Uh, I try to do functional things. You know, this one perhaps was not as functional, but I I like the shape a lot. Um, so yeah, I try to focus on functional things so that other people can have this intimate um, encounter with that child. And a lot of people will not be able to read the Braille. Is that not important to you that they um, that they know what it says necessarily? Um, so it. It's definitely intentional. I think the fact that you wouldn't be able to read it um, is kind of representative of my place in the world where I feel isolated and people don't necessarily understand my experience. And so this is kind of my way of flipping things and forcing you into a position where you may not be um, able to understand or feel comfortable. But I have definitely um, been more open to providing the translation because I do want it.
to be um, an open discourse about disability, and, um, especially artists with disability in the, in the craft world. I loved this and brought it into the voicing section because it was exuberantly about gender and uh, celebration. Um, so that was another kind of aspect of uh, gender and uh, this kind of idea of the voice and the proud voice um, that was a part of this moment in time and history. Sad that she's not here to talk about it, but, um, and Marilyn is not here either, I know, um, but Marilyn's, these two works here, a great example of Marilyn kind of using needlework um, to talk about women and women's roles, and in this case, talking about the sort of idea of going to the polls and uh, the, the, the importance of the political voice on the streets that uh, was very much a part of our pandemic experience. Um, Shelby, also met here, um, who uh, has been part of the um, Salsa Artist Fellowship, really examining ideas of gender and the sort of shifting and fluid ideas connected to uh, gender. I think it's a, this is a really great lineup um, that we have here to think about all of the different expressions of gender with these, um, these great figures that uh, she's kind of twisted around and put on top of um, pedestals uh, for us to kind of uh, think about what, how they're expressing themselves and whether gender is an important part of that or not. Hey, um, my name is Elaine Emmons. I am Cherokee. I'm a member of the Cherokee Nation. I'm really proud of my Cherokee heritage, but I didn't really grow up knowing a lot about it. Um, I did, my, my father passed away and my grandfather died when I was very young. And so I didn't really know a lot about my connection to the tribe. And I've tried to learn more and tried to embrace more, but I had documents that were my grandfather's. And he was actually on the roll, the rolls, the Dawes rolls. And the documents were allotment deeds and leases, and they have his name, and and it was very, very moving to me, and really powerful. And it would have like his certificate of degree of Indian blood, like how much Cherokee he was, um, and just the numbers on the allotments. And they were just, it was really powerful for me to have those papers. And I lost them during a series of moves, and knew I had them in a folder, and I misplaced them. And I came across them a few months ago again, and they just had even more power to me. And so I started photo transferring them onto silk. This is silk taffeta. And I love to do soft sculpture and do shapes, but I first printed onto silks, and I used his actual documents. And then I used historical maps. And it just kind of evolved into a whole trail of tear and just the trauma of the Cherokees and other tribes as well, but I, learned, I tried to study and learn more about the, actual, the Cherokee tribe. And so this is the path of the Trail of Tears. This is Indian Territory. Uh, the piece is called the Trail Where We Cried, which is what, how they refer to it. It became known as the Trail of Tears, but um, tribal members called it the Trail Where We Cried, many of them. Um, so. Again, there are historical maps, the actual paths during Indian removal. So the Indians were forcefully removed, the Cherokees and other tribes, but the Cherokees were moved from Georgia and the southeast across, and they, over 4,000 of them died. And that most of them didn't have warning that they were gonna be moved. They just were moved. And so the Indian Removal Act is something that you know, I learned more about and got very emotional about. But um, so I transferred the pieces onto the silk and started just kind of playing with the silk and, and the, ball, the ball shape, just, it just kind of evolved into that. So I started, you know, sewing it and piecing it and it just was so blank. And so I, I took some red textile ink, metallic ink, and just started pouring it. And I left it in my studio. I just poured on it and left it in there and came back and it was just, okay, that's, that's it. And so I, I guess I felt like I've really been um, raised up by my elders during this. And it's, it's really one of the, you know, the only emotional piece probably I've ever done because I felt such a connection to my father and my grandfather. Uh, so anyway, the, the red is the tears of blood and loss 
from the um, Indian removal across the country where they were relocated and so many thousands of Cherokees died. Um, and then as I said, a lot of documents actually have my grandfather's name. Um, so anyway, just... And is that, is that a plant growing up through there? What's the... Well, it was kind of... I like to do fruits and shapes and usually much happier things. And I like wiring and so I wired it and it kind of, it almost like, it's almost a, you know, a stereotypical like native too. And so it's wired through it. And, and the leaf was important to me, but it needed to be dark. It started out light and I, you know, got paint out again and, you know, black paint, then gold, and, and then the blood again, or the tears. And so it just kind of, it's kind of an organic or a fruit or a, you know, shape, but yet, you know, obviously much darker <laughs> because of the blood. But anyway, so, and then the running, it needed to like kind of continue to, to run, like the path and that, you know, it's still, still really an unresolved, you know, trauma for many tribal people. So anyway, that was, that's, yeah. So once again, and I think this is uh, true. It's unfortunate when you, when you work in an institution that shows craft, but it is it is so like literally touching. It's it's, it's work that's really effective because of its tactility, and um, I, I think it's beautifully uh, it's beautifully expressed not only by uh, the way that you created this out of fabric, but by how connected you are to it personally. Uh, both in terms of your ancestry, but and in terms of the way you're sort of actively. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody else gets to do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and I, I'll just end on there. See you This is a wonderful thank tale. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Really. Sure. Amazing story of, of sort of Oklahoma history with this great needlepoint you know, Oklahoma Gothic and this great needlepoint you know, Clara Looper, um, who uh, are other people, other great Oklahoma voices um, that we should listen to and that we have a special opportunity to listen to. I think um, some of the voices that I've really appreciated, thank you all so much for being willing on the, on the spur of the moment to talk more about your piece. I think this was wonderful for me. Um, when I didn't get to actually uh, talk to you before uh, while I was doing this. Uh, I hope it's wonderful uh, for the viewers uh, who get to see this video in the future. Thank you all so much for sharing uh, your voices today, but also for sharing your work with the audience.